thank you, Lolita. Thank you to the Center for uh, South Asia for inviting me, and thank all of you for coming today. Um, late last year, as Lolita said, uh, I published a book called The Snake and the Mongoose, in which I argue for a reassessment of the way in which we understand the diachronic relationship between two key categories of religious identity in ancient India, Sharamana and Brahmi. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you, most of you probably have not read the book. So uh, in my remarks today, I'm going to summarize the basic argu argument that I make in the book and then move on to show how the methodology introduced in the book can be used to help illuminate the development of religious identities in the period between the empires. This term, taken from the title of a conference held at UT Austin, refers to the period between the Mauryan Empire of the 3rd century BCE and the Gupta Empire beginning in the 3rd century CE. I will attempt to paint a picture of the development of religious identity in India over this time period, tentative as it may be, drawing on the relevant recent scholarship, the arguments I present in The Snake and the Mongoose, and further developments in my research since that book's publication. My central argument will be that we need to stop thinking about ancient Indian religion in terms of meta-historical essences, usually articulated as Brahmanical and non-Brahmanical, and instead think about it in terms of a dynamic contestation over what it means to be and or become a Brahmin. The latest scholarly opinion places the life of the Buddha, and thus also of Mahavira, his contemporary, <coughs> during the 5th century BCE. The time period in which these important teachers lived is an important but little understood period in India's history, stretching from when the prose Upanishads were composed in perhaps uh, 6th century BCE, to the unification of North India under the Nandas in the mid-4th century BCE, which I will dub the long 5th century BCE. This period witnessed enormous changes in North Indian society propelled by the second urbanization, a re-urbanization of North India after the much earlier collapse of the Indus Valley civilization, but this time centered in the Ganges Valley. Politically, North India at this time was divided into city-states known as Janapadas, conventionally said to have numbered 16 in total. These Janapadas increasingly came to vie with one another for power, with Magadha ultimately conquering the other Janapadas in the 4th century BCE under the Nanda dynasty. The long 5th century BCE in India was thus similar, uh, somewhat similar to the warring states period in China, in which the various dukedoms of the Zhou dynasty vied for power, culminating in the unification of China by the state of Qin in 221 BCE. The urbanization of this period led to increased opportunities for wealth accumulation. This in turn led to a split between householder and ascetic ideals that was characteristic of the age and became a key theme in Indian religions from then on. Oral texts known as the Vedas, which were composed from the late second millennium BCE and continuing through the middle of the first millennium BCE, were transmitted by religious specialists known as Brahmins. The Vedas formed the primary preceding context for the developments of the fifth century BCE. <coughs> they contain passages supportive of both householder and ascetic ideals. On the one hand, the Vedas speak of material prosperity and the duty to produce children. On the other hand, aspects of Vedic practice involve celibacy and ascetic-like renunciation. In the semi-nomadic society that produced the Vedic texts, these two ideals could coexist in productive tension with one another. But the increased wealth accumulation that urbanization allowed appears to have led to a bifurcation between them. Some were quite happy to take advantage of the opportunity to accumulate great wealth, while others, who came to be known as Shramanas, were highly critical of the accumulation of wealth and embraced more or less extreme renunciatory ideals in response. The word Shramana comes from the verbal root Shram, which means to toil and or become tired. The meaning implied is thus quite close to that of the English word ascetic, by which it is commonly translated. Most modern scholarship has assumed that the Shramanas arose in opposition to the Brahmins who were committed to this worldly values and slow to accept the supposedly new values of renunciatory asceticism. In my book, I argue that this model is predicated on a methodological error and an, anach and an anachronistic reading of the evidence. Buddhist and Jain sutras from before the Common Era are highly critical of Brahmins who do not renounce. And the 2nd century BCE Br Brahmin grammarian Patanjali gives Shramana Brahmana as an example of an oppositional compound whose members are characterized by eternal strife. Scholars have taken this as evidence of the opposition between Shramanas and Brahmins, and indeed it is clear that Shramanas and Brahmins came to be seen as opposed in ancient India. But there's no reason to assume that this was always the case. To do so is to treat these two identities as metahistorical essences. Drawing from the theoretical work of Jean-François Bayard on cultural identity, 
I prefer to treat them as dynamic articulations responding to the immediate conditions of any point in history. Reaching a clear understanding of the social conditions of the long 5th century BCE, during which Sharamana became, first became a key moniker of identity, is difficult due to a dearth of sources. The early Buddhist sutras are the best source for the period immediately after the composition of the early Upanishads, but they were passed down orally for centuries, and in the form they come down to us, they probably reflect the somewhat later imperial period. As I have argued, however, there is plenty of evidence in the earliest Buddhist and Jain sources, as well as the edicts of Ashoka, for the term Shramana and Brahman being used in a non-mutually exclusive, non-oppositional manner. The most plentiful example is the compound Shramana Brahmana, variously spelled according to the relevant Pali or Prakrit. Contrary to what Patanjali implies, this compound is never used in an oppositional way. Instead, the compound is used both by Buddhists and by Ashoka to treat, to treat Shramanas and Brahmins as a single category of people worthy of gifts and honor. In addition, Buddhists use the compound to treat them as a single category of people with various wrong views. Moreover, I argue on the basis of the very oldest Buddhist and Jain texts, the Atakavagga, Parayana Vagga, Ayaranga Sutta, and Suyagaranga Sutta, that early Buddhists and Jains claim that their respective founders and those who achieve liberation in their respective dispensations are Brahmins. While earlier scholars have taken such passages as representing a co-opting of the prestige of the Brahmins, I argue that we should take the early Buddhists and Jains seriously as Brahmins because that is what they claim to be. Their claim was by no means Ill illogical. It appears to be based on the Vedic concept of Brahmacharya, the initiatory process for a Brahmin that requires celibacy and a degree of renunciation. As Tim Lubin has argued, some Vedic passages seem to imply that at one time, Brahmacharya is what made a person a Brahmin. I therefore propose that the religious world of North India during the long 5th century BCE should be understood as a single Brahmanical field consisting of a loose system of teachers attracting pupils. That this was the actual situation is obscured by the fact that most of our sources for the period deliberately efface the embeddedness of their founders and movements within the broader social world of the time. Jain and Buddhist sources, on the one hand, attempt to portray their respective <coughs> founders as having become awakened sui generis, and thus downplay the links they had to other teachers and exaggerate their independent followings. Brahmanical sources, on the other hand, engage in a process of hypervedicization and ignore for centuries the existence of groups who operated under different imaginaires. An important source for discerning the actual structure of North Indian religious society during the long 5th century BCE is the Isi Pasiyayin, an old but obscure Jain text that scholars have noted is rather unique in its portrayal of ancient Indian religious teaching. It consists of verses attributed to a variety of seers, or Isis, several of whose names can be identified with figures that came to be associated with specific sectarian traditions. Yagyalokya and Narada from the Brahmanical tradition, Shariputra, or perhaps the Buddha himself, and Mahakashiva from the Buddhist tradition, Bharadhavana and Barshva from the Jain tradition, and Makali Gosala from the Ajivaka tradition. Although the verses attributed to all of them have a somewhat Jain cast, unique doctrines nonetheless sometimes appear in particular cases and the teachers are all treated on equal footing as independent authorities, not ranked or otherwise grouped according to supposed sectarian affiliation. The Jains composed their scriptures relatively late compared to the Buddhists, and as we will see, probably had a more protracted process of solidifying their identity. Therefore, it is possible the Isipasiyayi represents an early attempt to project identity in a manner that differed from that of the Buddhists and of later Jains not by valorizing a single putative founder, but by putting one's own spin on the actual variegated religious landscape. A loose system of teachers, all claiming to be Brahmins, or to show the way to Brahminhood, would necessarily have shown a great deal of diversity in the ideology and practice. I propose this diversity can be represented by dividing the Brahmanical teachers of the long 5th century BCE into three broad categories. First, there was an avant-garde, consisting of the most radical, hardcore shramanas. These teachers and groups embraced the most innovative ideas and practices of the time and ran with them. This included samsara, karma, the search for the self and its liberation, meditation, asceticism, and celibacy. They made use of the vernacular, not necessarily out of any conscious opposition to Sanskrit, 
but simply, be, uh, simply since that was the practical mode of communication at that time, which was well before the, the so-called birth of Sanskrit as a classical language. In addition, although their ideas and practices were indebted to their earlier Vedic tradition, as we saw in the last section, they made little reference to it because, as is the case in an avant-garde, it did not interest them to do so. The second group would have been reactionary Brahmanical householders. These I identify with the authors of the Brahmanical Sutra literature, in particular the Dharma Sutras. These teachers were committed to a householder lifestyle, and as such they rejected the asceticism of the Shramanas, especially their commitment to lifelong celibacy, arguing that there is a Vedic injunction that all men must sire children. Unlike the avant-garde, they did make constant reference back to the Vedic tradition, even as they were innovative in their appropriation of it. They were, as such, committed to the maintenance of the yajna and the language of the Vedas, Sanskrit, in the face of their increasing irrelevance. Finally, although these first two groups most clearly represented the divide between renunciatory and householder values, there was a third group that I would characterize as, as a conservative but not reactionary mainstream. These are the practitioners that Buddhist texts refer to by the slang term jatila, referring to their matted hair, and that the Dharma Sutra is referred to by their, the more descriptive term Vanaprastha, or forest dweller. These groups embrace the newest ideas of the age, while still maintaining a connection to the Vedic tradition through their maintenance of a sacred fire. They thus represented a conservative continuity with the world of the Upanishads, neither radically breaking from the Vedic past nor taking a reactionary stance against the avant-garde. The age of the Janapadas came to an end in the mid-4th century BCE when the Nanda dynasty of Magadha, a Janapada located in modern-day Bihar, conquered much of North India. The Nanda dynasty was overthrown in 322 BCE by Chandragupta Maurya, who expanded the empire to the northwest. In the 3rd century, his grandson, Ashoka Maurya, conquered virtually the entire subcontinent. The Mauryan empire at this extent did not last long, and the dynasty was overthrown in 185 <coughs> BCE, when the last Mauryan emperor was assassinated by the Brahmin Pushyamitra Shunga. But this imperial period was a crucial turning point in Indian history. It was this period that writing, using the Brahmi script that is the basis of most modern South Asian scripts, was introduced in India for the first time since the collapse of the Indus Valley civilization. In addition, although a subcontinent wide <coughs> polity would only be re reintroduced intermittent, intermittently in later history, Ashoka's unification of the region however brief, served as the basis for a unified, albeit diverse, Indian culture. Finally, the Maurya's patronage of Shramana group served as an impetus driving the reactionary efforts of householder, uh, that is, non-Shramanic Brahmins. Although the anonymous post-Vedic literature of the Brahmins, like the Vedas themselves, is notoriously difficult to date, it was around the imperial period that a vast literature in Sanskrit, in spite of the drift of the vernacular away from the language of the Vedas, was composed, both it's about Sanskrit itself and about the yajna, which was also becoming increasingly obsolete. It seems safe to assume that certain Brahmins in this, area were, in this era were concerned, due to their reactionary tendencies, to maintain traditions that were falling into disuse as the intellectual currents of their day moved past them. The dating of the grammat grammatical literature on Sanskrit is the most certain. The first grammar of Sanskrit, or any language in India, the Ashtadhyayi, was composed in the mid-4th century BCE by Banini, and an extensive commentary on the Ashtadhyayi, the Mahabhashya, was composed by Patanjali during the reign of Pushyamitra Shunga in the mid to late 2nd century BCE. As it happens, these two major grammatical works serve roughly as bookends for the imperial period. Around the same time, Brahmins composed Sanskrit works explaining the Yajna in a new genre, the Sutra, a pithy, almost bullet-point-like format useful for detailed explanations. These texts fall into two classes, the Shrauta Sutras, which explain the extensive yajna rites found in, the, found in the Vedas, and the Grehya Sutras, which explain simplified household rituals derived from the former. <coughs> Although the grammatical works and ritual sutras reflect the reactionary concerns of the householder Brahmins, these concerns find their culmination in a third class of sutra literature, the Dharma Sutras. Modern scholars usually characterize the Dharma Sutras as the beginning of the tradition of Indian law, the Dharma Shastra, which indeed they are, uh, but within their immediate context they were an ideological response to the concept of dharma found among the shramanas. 
While Dharma for the Sharamanas was universalistic and oriented toward the ultimate goal of liberation, France Sansara, that would be attained by that would only be attained by a few. Dharma for the Dharma Sutras and later Dharma Shastra tradition was particularistic, even if subsumed under the authority of the Veda. It focused on ordinary life and was differentiated among various social groups. In my book, I argue that in the Dharma Sutras, reactionary Brahmins created two ideological tools whose purpose was to combat Sharamanic ideology and establish the supremacy of the householder lifestyle. These two tools were Varna and Ashrama, the twin pillars of the Varnashrama Dharma that would become a central tenet of classical Hinduism. Although issues of birth can be found in earlier Vedic texts, the antiquity of the Varna system as a rigid system of four classes determined solely by birth has, I have argued, been grossly exaggerated, and can only be found explicitly stated for the first time in the Apastamba Dharma Sutra. The purpose of defining it in this rigid sense was to divorce Brahmanhood from the practice of celibacy and asceticism, as implied by certain Vedic texts on Brahmacharya, and seized upon in Sharamanic conceptions of Brahmanhood as rooted in Brahmacharya. The second ideological tool, the Ashrama system, then served to define the major forms of religious practice in ancient India for the purpose of rejecting all except that of the householder. As, we, as was shown by Olivelle, uh, the Ashrama system in the Dharma Sutras is not a series of four stages of life, but rather four lifelong options. Three of them, Brahmacharya or student, Vanaprastha or forest dweller, and Parivrajaka or wanderer, celibate, and one, the Grahastha or house dweller, not. Note that the term Ashrama is based on the same verbal root, Shram, as is Shramana. The Dharma Sutra authors cleverly characterized the life of a householder as a form of asceticism, and then made the audacious claim that it was the best or only form of asceticism because it, it alone satisfied the Vedic injunction to produce children. The evidence shows that by the end of the imperial period, when Patanjali characterized the Sharamana and Brahman as being opposed in eternal strife, the reactionary householder Brahmins were fully successful in arrogating the appellation Brahman to themselves. They did so by relentlessly referring to their own form of Brahmanism as the only valid form of Brahmanism, and by mostly ignoring the terms and claims of identity made by Shramanas. Buddhists, on the other hand, uh, produced a significant literature portraying the Buddha debating with householder Brahmins. While these texts, which I call encounter dialogues, are arguably more logically cogent than the claims made by the householder Brahmins, they serve mainly to provide free advertising to the latter's claims, in particular the Varna system, a gift that the householder Brahmins did not reciprocate. In any case, major Sharamana groups, including the Buddhists, the Jains, and the Ajivakas, effectively ceded claims to the term Brahman. This created the opposition between the identity Sharamana and Brahman that was in full force by the time Patanjali wrote his commentary in the 2nd century BCE. As the opposition between the identity Sharamana and Brahman became increasingly bifurcated, identities formed among the Sharamanas to distinguish them from one another. I will begin with the ascetics referred to as Vanaprasthas, or forest dwellers in the Dharma Sutras, or by the slang term Jatila, referring to their matted hair in Buddhist texts. I characterize these ascetics as forming the conservative mainstream of ancient Brahmanism. To be, keep, to be clear, by mainstream, I do not mean to imply that they were the majority, only that they represented a natural continuity with the general thrust of Vedic thought and practice. This mainstream was conservative in, the, in that it was neither radical in its pursuit of new ideas like certain Sharamana groups, nor was it reactionary in opposing them like the householder Brahmins. A variety of practices are attributed to Vanaprasthas slash Jatilas in the Dharma Sutras and Buddhist texts, among them living in the forest, keeping matted hair, subsisting on clothes and food derived from the forest, and maintaining a sacred fire. It seems that often they were celibate, but at times would dwell in the forest with a wife. It is difficult to ascertain the precise doctrines of these ascetics, who indeed were probably quite diverse, because they did not produce a literature of their own in the same way as the Jains, Buddhists, and reactionary Brahmins. Unlike the Sharamana groups that I will turn to next, the Vanaprasthas slash Jatilas did not develop a strong sense of self-identity. Both of the terms for them were applied by outsiders, and in fact they ultimately did not participate in the separation of Sharamana identity from Brahmanical identity. Instead, they maintained their links to Vedic tradition sufficiently 
that they were absorbed into the classical grammatical synthesis as it became more accommodating to ascetic lifestyles, as I will discuss shortly. The more radical Shramana group that is arguably more cl most closely related to the Vanaprastas is the Buddhists, although this is not the name that they were known by in ancient India. Instead, they called themselves the Samana Sakyaputtiya, or ascetics who are sons of the Shakya. Uh, and they were known as such or simply as Shakyas for centuries. The name refers to the fact that the founder of their order, or Sangha, was from the Shakya clan, along what is now the border between India and Nepal. According to the early Buddhist or Shakya literature, the founder of the order named Gautama studied with two teachers, Alaraka Lama and Uddhkarama Putta, who appear to have participated in the same intellectual milieu that much later developed into Sankhya. These two teachers taught him two successive levels of meditative attainment, the sphere of nothingness and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, which they respectively claim to represent the final goal of liberation. Gautama, however, was dissatisfied with these attainments and is said to have discovered a yet higher attainment, the cessation of perception and feeling, which instead he claimed constituted awakening. Alexander Wynne has shown that the meditative techniques Gautama was trained in are similar to those described in Brahmanical texts, uh, in particular in the Moksha Dharma Parvana of the Mahabharata, uh, and I argue further that we can see Buddhism and Sankhya as sharing distant intellectual roots. And actually, I'm going to be speaking about that at the conference next month. Although Buddhist philosophy developed quite quickly, even before the Common Era, uh, originally the evidence would suggest it was based on a simple act of superenthronement involving not deities, but states of meditative attainment. More radical than the Shakyas in the Brahmanical avant-garde were extreme materialist ascetics who practiced renunciation to the point of going about completely naked and ultimately ending their lives by self-starvation. The earliest forms of identity for these ascetics, however, uh, are somewhat difficult to parse. According to modern terminology, they consisted of two groups, the Ajivikas, who died out before the modern period, and the Jains, who constitute a world religion today. This is not how their identities were taxon taxonomized in ancient times, however. In ancient India, there were two terms of identity for these groups, Nirgrantha, which means without bonds, and in, uh, in Prakrit that's in Nigantha, and Ajivaka, which means lifer. The Jain scriptures make use of Nigantha uh, as a term of self-identity, but not Ajivaka, implying a straightforward transition of two distinct groups, once called Nirgrantas and Ajivakas, later Jains and Ajivakas. As recent research has demonstrated, however, the relationship between these terms of identity is more complex. Ron Kors has shown that in the early Buddhist scriptures, Ajivaka refers to naked, that is a chelaka ascetics, while nigantas are invariably described as wearing a single garment. Likewise, although the Buddhist texts identify the leader of the nigantas as Nata Buddha, he is said to have taught to have taught a fourfold restraint. According to the Jain scriptures, Nata Buddha, uh, which in Arda Magadhi is, is spelled Naya Buddha, is to be identified with the 24th Tirthankara Vartamana Mahavira. The very distinction, however, between Vartamana and his predecessor, the 23rd Tirthankara Varshva, was that the latter, like the Nata Buddha of Buddhist texts, taught a fourfold restraint and wore a garment, while the latter ta taught a fivefold restraint and went naked. So there's, there's a discrepancy there. There's ample evidence that the Ajivakas were an important Sharamana group in ancient India, including the fact that no less than Ashoka donated caves to them. According to the early Buddhist sutras, Ajivakas recognized three preeminent teachers as having attained liberation, Nandavacha, Gisasamgicha, and Makkali Gosala. These three teachers are also listed in Buddhist texts together with the Nigantanata Putta, Bakutha Kachayana, and Puranakasapa as six teachers with wrong views. There's evidence that Puranakasapa and Pakuta Kachayana, though little is known about them, were in some way connected to the Ajivakas. So the inclusion of the Niganta Nataputta in this list implies a connection as well. Indeed, this is also implied by a passage of the Buddhist Sutras that attributes to the Ajivakas the belief that Nigantas wearing a garment were of a certain attainment, but, but below those of the three liberated beings, that is Nanda, Vacha, Gisa Sankicha, and Makali Gosala, as well as their naked followers. Valterowitz, in a recent publication, has shown that there was likely a relationship between Mahavira and Gosala that is preserved in the Jain scriptures but distorted to glorify the former and denigrate the latter. Chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita Sutra 
known as the Deya Nisabga, narrates in great detail the six years of asceticism, or excuse me, the six years of association plus other interactions between Mahavira and Makali Gosala. It reports that Mahavira reluctantly took Gosala as his disciple and later broke off his association and forbade his disciples' contact when the latter falsely claimed to have attained Jinnahood. Balterowitz argues that Mahavira was originally a clothier Grantha in the order of Parshva, who then became a disciple of Gosala for a time, leading to a lasting influence of Ajivakism on Jainism, whose memory was later expunged. This conclusion is based on three factors. One, the obvious polemical bent of the text. Two, the fact that six years of association are inexplicable in the, content of the, in the context of the story. And three, the fact that Mahavira apparently gave up clothing and began receiving alms in the palms of his hands, like an Ajivaka, in his second year of asceticism, at the same time that he began his association with Gosala. Balsarowitz's revisionist reading of the Thayani Sadga may be overly literalistic, but he is likely correct that the connection between the Jains and Ajivakas was much, much closer than Jainism came to admit. He does not, however, have a particularly convincing explanation for the fact that the Buddhist texts portray Nataputta as a Parshvite, or even as Parshva himself, that is, as wearing a garment and maintaining the fourfold restraint. He attributes it to a Buddhist misperception of the complicated relationship between Parshva, Mahavira, and Gosala. If we abandon the attempt, to take the Thayani Sangha even depolemicize his literal history, however, then it can be read as an old but nonetheless post facto attempt to make sense of the complicated relationship between the Nirgranthas and the Ajivakas. Valterowitz's insight that the tension between Nirgrantha and Ajivaka practice, and even to a certain extent doctrine, is reproduced to this day within Jainism in the Shvetambara and Digambara split, is surely on the right track. It need not be explained as Valterowitz does, however in terms of a literal temporary conversion of Mahavira to Ajivakism that brought in Ajivaka practice and teaching and a lasting tension between the Ajivaka imports and old Nirgrantha teachings within Jainism. Rather, this tension within Jainism can be explained by assuming that what we now call Jainism is the product of an ancient re uh, religious milieu that consisted of a close association between garment-clad Nirgranthas and naked Ajivakas, with a fluid allegiance to a multitude of teachers. For reasons that are now obscure, this religious culture became unified under allegiance to Varatamana Mahavira, a character likely partially mythologized and partly based on one or more historical figures, with allegiance to alternative figures like Gosala under the rubric Ajivaka eventually dying out. In the period we're concerned with then, there was a variegated landscape of extreme materialist ascetics, with a multitude of teachers uh, claiming followings divided roughly into two identities according to mode of ascetic practice, Nirgantas who wore garments and Ajivakas who went naked. The Buddhist passage I cited above implies that the latter saw the former as engaging in a valid form of asceticism, but less rigorous than their own. Based on the teachings recorded in the Jain scriptures, this milieu of extreme materialists, uh, extreme materialists while have, having various doctrines, probably shared the general belief that karma is a physical substance that weighs down the soul, keeping it trapped in samsara and preventing it from floating to the top of the universe and attaining it its, its innate state of bliss and omniscience. The path to liberation, therefore, ultimately necessitated the cessation of all physical action, the basis for the Jain practice of salekana, religious death by starvation. Bronkhorst Bronkhor has convincingly argued that the, the so-called fatalism attributed to Gosala and Ajivakism probably referred to the doctrine that past karma must simply be allowed to come to fruition over a multitude of lifetimes before liberation is possible in contrast to what became the standard Jain view that austerities can be used to burn off past <coughs> karma and thus hasten liberation. More research clearly needs to be done on the relationship between ancient forms of identity among shramanas and the medieval and modern forms of identity that developed out of them. In spite of the assumption otherwise, close examination makes it clear that the relationship between the two is not linear, and there were major reconfigurations of identity in antiquity and later on. As I noted above, Gautama, the founder of the Shakyas, or Buddhists, may have begun as a student who studied under teachers in the Brahmanical avant-garde, and then claimed awakening on the basis of a simple act of meditative superenthronement. The fully developed Buddhist scriptures of the Tripitaka, however, show significant development from such simple beginnings. The teaching of the Middle Way, later incorporated into the Buddha's biography in the form of his life as a prince and subsequent six years of austerity, appears to intentionally stake a position for the Shakyas 
between the extreme, the extreme asceticism of the materialists, the Nirgranthas and Ajivakas, and the indulgence of the Mahashala or householder Brahmins. It is also quite possible that the Shakyas adopted Nirgrantha Ajivaka, concep Ajivaka conceptions of sansara, which were not necessarily native to the milieu in which Gautama was trained. They turned them on their head, however, by replacing radical materialism with idealism, encapsulated in the Buddha's reported teaching, quote, it is intention that I call karma, end quote. Moreover, as I just explained, there must have been a complex process by which the radical materialists known as Nirgranthas and Ajivakas coalesced into the Jains. In addition, the process by which the mainstream teaching of the conservative Vanaprasthas was reabsorbed by reactionary Brahmins, uh, reactionary Brahminism is worthy of further study. The period between the fall of the Mauryan Empire in the 2nd century BCE and the foundation of the Gupta Empire in the 3rd century CE, that is, the period between the empires, witnessed a significant change in reactionary Brahminism strategy towards Shramanic practice, which would become central to the identity of classical Hinduism. The basic reactionary project continued to pace, but with a particular literary turn, coinciding with the birth of Sanskrit, through which reactionary Brahmins valorized Sanskrit as an eternal language and as Bronkhorst has dubbed it, colonized the past. They did so by writing their ideology, especially the Varna system, but also the importance of Yajna and Vedic mythology in general, into narratives of, of the past, most significantly the epic Mahabharata. Nevertheless, the project in this age was more accommodating to asceticism than it had been in the Dharma Sutras. Two examples of this accommodation to Sharmanic lifestyle serve to illustrate this point. The first is the revision of the ashrama system in the Manava Dharma Shastra, or <coughs> Laws of Manu. Students of Hinduism are usually most familiar with the ashrama system as found in this text, in which there are four stages of life. Uh, the Vedic student, Brahmacharin, householder, or Grahastha, forest dweller, or Vanaprastha, and wanderer, or Parivrajaka. As Olivelle showed, however, this was a modification from the earlier formulation found in the Dharma Sutras, in which the ashramas are options to choose from, of four lifelong vocations. This modification is significant. It signals a shift from rejection of Sharmanic lifestyles to accommodation of them within certain limits. Essentially, pursuit of liberation within a celibate ascetic lifestyle is permitted so long as one satisfies the Vedic injunction to produce children first. <coughs> Various Brahmanical texts produced in this period between the empire's advanced Varanashrama, with Ashrama modified in this way as the pinnacle of Dharma thus laying the groundwork for it to become a central principle of classical Hinduism. Perhaps the most important example is the Mahabharata, which frequently extols the importance of Varna and Ashrama throughout its narrative. Within the epic, the Bhagavad Gita advances the project of accommodation to asceticism in a different way, and I give it here as the second example of reactionary Brahmanism's accommodation to Shramanic lifestyles. In the Gita, Krishna describes three yogas, or religious paths. Karma Yoga, the path of action, Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, and Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion. He states that all three are valid, but the third is the best. The inclusion of Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga on equal terms indicates a synthesis of this worldly and renunciatory values. Krishna rejects the very possibility of non-action in an obvious swipe at the Ajivakas slash Nirgrantas, but in its place he enjoys, rena he enjoys renouncing the fruits of action, that is, acting without concern for the result or reward. Traditional Vedic sacrifices are accepted and even encouraged under the rubric Karma Yoga, but the text clearly accepts the Sharmanic premise, already implicit in the later Vedic literature itself, that sacrifice brings limited rewards. The inclusion of Jnana Yoga in indicates the acceptance of meditative as opposed to harsh mortificatory forms of ascetic practice, with Krishna specifically adopting the language of proto-sankhya. The inclusion of bhakti yoga, however, as the best of the three yogas, represents an audacious act of inclusivism that allows for the ultimate synthesis of this worldly and renunciatory values. Yes, you can and should engage in ritual and other action, but it brings limited rewards, and you should renounce those rewards anyway. Yes, you can engage in the pursuit of the Atman, but it is difficult. It is best to simply devote yourself to God in the person of, in the person of Krishna, and he will liberate you from the suffering of samsara. Although the sense of opposition between Sharmanas and Brahmins was clearly, clearly quite strong in the 2nd century BCE, as attested by Patanjali, and Sharmanas had developed internal terms of identity by that time as well, it is interesting that throughout the period between the empires, reactionary Brahmins did not engage with Sharmanas on the latter's own terms. 
The converse was not true. Jain is, and especially Buddhist texts from the very beginning engaged directly with the claims of reactionary householder Brahmins. The fact that the latter did not reciprocate for many centuries appears to have been part of a deliberate strategy to portray the entire world in reactionary Brahmanical terms. This situation finally changed during and after the Gupta Empire, so the late 3rd century to 543 CE. Uh, as Virardi has argued, the Gupta Empire was the realization of these Brahmins' hopes and dreams, as expressed so frequently in the literature of the period between the empires. Elchinga has argued more specifically that during the Gupta Empire, there was a shift in the theory of yugas from uh, concern about leches or barbarians in this Kali Yuga to concern about Pashandas or sectarians. This, he argues, was due to the fact that foreign invaders were less of a concern during a period of stable indigenous rule, and under the highly sympathetic patronage of the Bhagavata Guptas, Brahmins turned their attention instead to enemies within. From the 6th century onwards, we finally see specific references to Sharamana groups in the Brahmanical literature, with the Mimamsa under, under Kumara Labhatta in particular, reforming as a direct polemical refutation of uh, so-called heretical systems, including those of the Shakyas and Nirgranthas. Thus was completed the transformation of shamanic and Brahmanical identity into the form in which we know it today. So allow me to go back and review the dynamic development, development of articulations, re-articulations of identity that I have outlined in this lecture. What I have called the long 5th century BCE, at the close of the Vedic period, was characterized not by the sudden eruption of shramanas in opposition to the pre-existing Brahmins. Rather, it was characterized by a diverse Brahmanical field in which various teachers operated in a shared intellectual environment in continuity with Vedic thought and practice, but staking out different positions vis-a-vis -vis one another, and thus implicitly with respect to the Vedic past. Ideologically, these teachers could be placed on a scale from the most avant-garde to the most reactionary, with a conservative mainstream in the middle. Shramara originally was not a term of identity in opposition to Brahminhood. It began as a form of Brahmanical identity that embraced a vision of Brahmanhood rooted in celibacy and renunciation. This vision was opposed by reactionary Brahmins who insisted on the need to produce children. They were successful in arrogating the identity Brahmin to themselves, leading to the bifurcation and opposition between the identities Sharamana and Brahmin. This in turn opened up a space for various Sharamana groups to articulate unique identities vis-a-vis -vis one another. Among the radical materialists, Two identities, Nirgrantha and Ajivaka, seem to have been operative in ancient times, with dress or nakedness being an important dividing line between them. The tension between these two identities survived within the Jain identity that developed later. Meanwhile, the Shakya identity, later known as Buddhist, developed around the figure of Shakyamuni, who may have studied meditation within the mainstream current of cosmogonic speculation that would later develop into Sankhya Yoga. Although Shakyamuni's original claim to awakening seems to have been a simple act of meditative superenthronement, the Shakyas developed a strategy known as the, the middle path, whereby they situated their own identity between what they characterize as two extremes, the luxury of reactionary householder Brahmins and the extreme asceticism of the radical materialists. Although the reactionary householder Brahmins were successful in irrigating Brahmanical identity themselves, eventually they were forced to accommodate on the issue of renunciation. The Madhava Dharma Shastra modified the ashrama system to convert it from a taxonomical tool to assert the primacy of the householder lifestyle into a tool of accommodation, allowing for renunciatory lifestyles after one had married and produced children. This modification then allowed for the reabsorption of the conservative mainstream of Shramanic practice, that is, those known as Vanaprasthas or Jakilas, into Brahmanism. With the triumph of this newly constituted Brahmanism of the Gupta Empire, followed by its collapse in the 6th century, Brahmins finally articulated their own identity in such a way as to make explicit their opposition to specific forms of Sharamanic identity, those of the Shakyas and Nirgrantas. And this, of course, was the foundation of the religious identities that we recognize today as having emerged from Indian antiquity, Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain. Thank you.